by Ferdinand de Oyon. It was evening. The sun had gone down from behind the high peaks. The deep shadow of the forest was closing in. The last night of my holiday in Spanish Guinea came steadily down. Soon, I would be leaving this country, known to us as Frenchmen from the Cameroons, as a, a breakaway place. Whenever things got a little bit strained between ourselves and our white compatriots, there was a sinister roll of drums. I could not understand the language of the drum used by my Spanish friends, but I knew from the troubled looks on their faces that the drum spoke of some misfortune. It says, a French man is ill. They do not think he will last the night. So we set out. We passed it through two villages. The dying man lay on a bamboo bed. His eyes were haggard. He was curled up, folded into himself like a, like a huge antelope. His shirt was full of blood. This stench will make us ill, someone said. I've never seen a man die. And there was a man before me, in pain. And I saw him. I saw him utterly untransfigured by any glimmer of the afterlife. He, he looked like he could still summon the stubborn energy not to go on the great journey. He coughed. Blood ran between his lips. The man was young. I bent over and asked him if there was something that he wanted. He stretched out his trembling hand and stroked the knee of my trousers. A Frenchman, he panted. A Frenchman, are you from the Cameroons? I nodded. I recognize you were, brother, by your face. Suddenly, his vacant eyes shone. They never left me. Brother, he said, what are we? What are we, black men who are called French? Spasm seized him. He shuddered and expired. He could not be kept till morning, and they buried him directly that night. He was already rotten when he died. I learned that they found him unconscious in the frontier in the Spanish zone. So a Khaki bundle was handed over to me. I opened the packet. Inside, there was a toothbrush, a stub of pencil, a native comb made of ivory, and the two worn exercise books. That is how I came to read Tundi's diary. First exercise book. Father Gilbert says I can read and write fluently. Father Gilbert says I can read and write fluently. Now I can keep a diary like he does. Now I can keep a diary like he does. Keeping a diary is a white man's custom and what pleasure there is in it I do not know. What pleasure there is in it? I do not know. But I shall try it out. While my master and benefactor was hearing confessions, I had a look into his diary. Ah, it is a grain store for memories. These white men can preserve everything. In Father Gilbert's diary, I found a kick he gave me when he caught me, mimicking him in the sacristy. In Father Gilbert's diary, I found the kick he gave me when he caught me mimicking him in the sacristy. I felt my bottom burning all over again. It is strange. I thought I had forgotten all about it. My name is Tondi Ondoa, 
My name is Tondi Ondowa. I am the son of Tondi and of Zama. I'm the son of Tondi and Zama. When the father baptized me, he gave me the name of Joseph. They say in the village that I was the cause of my father's death because I ran away to a white priest on the day before initiation when I should have met the famous serpent who watches over all the men of my race. Father Gilbert believes it was the Holy Spirit that led me to him. In fact, I just wanted to get close to the white man with hair like the beard on a maize cob who dressed in women's clothes and gave little black boys sugar lumps. He threw the little lumps of sugar to us like throwing corn to chickens. What a badly to get hold of one of those little white lumps. They were worth all the, the scraped knees, swollen eyes, and painful cuts. Sometimes, these distributions of sugar turned into brawls between our parents. One day, my mother got into a fight with the mother of my friend, Chinati, because he had twisted my arm to make me let go of two lumps of sugar, which I had worn at the cost of a bleeding nose. My father, armed with a cane, invited me to follow him behind the house. You, Tondi, you are the cause of this whole business. Your greediness will be the ruin of us. Anyone would think that you don't have enough to eat at all. On the day before your abam, you have to go across the stream to beg lumps of sugars from some white man, woman who is a complete stranger to you. My father, however, was not a stranger, and I was well acquainted with what he could do with a stick. Whenever he went for either my mother or me, it always took us a week to recover. I was a good way from his stick. He swished it in the air and came towards me. I edged backwards. Are you going to stop? I've got no lead chasing you. Oh, Tony, if I don't get you now, I will wait a hundred years to give you your punishment. Now, Tony, come here and get it done, and get it done with. I haven't done anything to be beaten for, Father. Ah, he roared. You dare say you haven't done anything. I warn you, you move one step backwards, I will take it as an insult. Ah, Tony, if I don't get you now, that would be a sign that you are capable of taking your mother to bed. I stopped. He flung himself on me, and the cane swished it down onto my bare shoulders. I twisted like a worm in the sun. Put up your arms and turn around. I don't want to knock out your arm. Let me off, Father. I won't do it again. That's what you always say when I have to give you a thrashing. But today, I am going on thrashing and thrashing until I am not angry. My father gave me another blow that I neatly dodged. If you dare dodge again, it will be a sign that you are capable of taking my mother, your, your grandmother, to bed. My father always used this blackmail to stop me from getting away and to make me submit to his blows. I have not insulted you, father, and I'm not capable of taking my mother or your mother to bed. And I won't be beaten anymore. So then, how dare you speak to me like that? A drop of my own liquid speaking to me like that? Unless you stand still at once, I shall curse you. My father was choking. I had never seen him so furious. I went on backing away from him. He came on after me, down behind the huts for a good hundred yards. Well then, he said, we'll see where you will spend the night. I will tell your mother that you have insulted us both. Your way back into my house will be through my anus. With that, he turned his back. I did not know where I could go. I had an uncle I did not like because of his scabies. His wife smelled of bad fish, and so did he. I hated going into their house. It was growing dark. I went back to fear. 
And after hesitating for a long while, I knocked at the white priest's door. I found him in the middle of his dinner. He was very surprised. I tried to explain through signs that I wanted to go away with him. He laughed with all his teeth, so his mouth looked like a crescent moon. I stood shyly by the door. He made signs that I should come closer, and he offered me what was left of his meal. I found it strange and delicious. We continued the conversation by signs. I knew I had been accepted. That is how I became Father Gilbert's boy. Father Gilbert gave me a pair of khaki shorts and a red jersey. All the boys in fear were so impressed by this that they came to ask Father Gilbert to take them on as well. Two days later, Father Gilbert took me on his motorcycle. No, no. through the villages by the noise we made. His tour had lasted a fortnight, and now we were on our way back to the St. Peter's Catholic Mission at Dangan. I was happy. The speed intoxicated me. I was going to learn about the city and the white men and live like them. I caught myself thinking I was like one of the wild parrots we used to attract to the village with grains of maize. They were captured through their greediness. My mother often used to say, laughing, Tundi, what will your greediness bring you to? My parents are dead. My parents are dead. I've never been back to the village. I have never been back to the village. Now I'm at the St. Peter's Catholic Mission in Danga. I wake up every morning at 5 o'clock and even earlier sometimes when all the priests are at the mission. I ring the bell, hang at the entrance to the sacristy. Then I wait for the first father to come for mass. I serve up to three or four masses a day. The skin on my knees is now as hard as crocodile skin. When I kneel down, I seem to be kneeling on cushions. Everything I am, I owe to Father Gilbert. He's my benefactor, and I'm very fond of him. He's cheerful and pleasant. When I was small, he treated me like a pet animal. He loved to pull my ears. And all the time I've been getting an education, he has loved to watch my constant amazement at everything. He presents me to the whites who visit the mission as his masterpiece. I'm his boy, a boy who can read, write, lay a table, sweep out his room, make his bed. <laughs> I do not earn any money. You 
My father, my benefactor, Father Gilbert, is dead. They found him bloody and crushed on his motorcycle by the side of a branch from the giant cotton tree that the natives call the Hammer of the Whites. My benefactor was buried in the corner of the cemetery reserved for Europeans. The grave of Father Gilbert lies next to the grave of Monsieur Diamond's daughter, the one he had by his mistress and acknowledged. Father van der Meyer said in the burial service, all the Europeans in Dangan were there, even the Americans from the Protestant mission. It is only now that I realize that Father Gilbert is dead. I have not heard his voice since yesterday. The Catholic mission is in mourning. But for me, it is more than mourning. I have died in my first death. I saw the girl from the communion at the funeral. She shut her eyes again. She is stupid. Commandant needs a boy. Father van der Meyer told me to report to the residence tomorrow. I am glad because I have not been able to bear life at the mission since Father Gilbert died. Of course, it is a good riddance for Father van der Meyer as well. I shall be the chief European's boy. The dog of the king is the king of dogs. The dog of the king it is the king of dogs. I shall leave the mission this evening. From now on, I shall live with my brother-in-law in the location. A new life is starting for me. Oh Lord, thy will be done. At last, it has happened. The commandant has definitely taken me into his service. It was midnight. I had finished my work and was getting ready to go back to the location when the commandant told me to follow him into his office. It was a terrible moment for me. After he had looked at me for a long while, he asked me point blank, Are you a thief? Are you a thief? Are you a thief? Are you a thief? No, no, sir. I answered, why aren't you a thief? Because I do not want to go to hell, sir. He seemed taken aback by my answer. He tossed his head in disbelief. Where did you learn that? I'm a Christian, sir. I told him and proudly showed him the St. Christopher medal I wear around my neck. So, you're not a thief because you don't want to go to hell. Yes, sir. What is it like? Hell. Well, sir, it is, it is flames and the, and, the, and the snakes and the devil with horns. There's a picture of hell in my prayer book. I can show it to you. Good, good. Joseph, we shall be friends. Thank you, sir. But if you steal, I shan't wait for you to go to hell. It's too far. Yes, sir, it is. Where is it, sir? I had never asked myself the question. My master was amused to see my puzzlement. He shrugged and leaned against the back of his chair. If you steal from me, I will skin you alive. Uh, yes, sir. I, I, I didn't say that now, sir, just because I took that for granted, sir. All right, all right. Said the commandant impatiently. He got up and began to walk around me. You're a clean lad, he said, looking me over carefully. No jiggers, your shirt is clean, no scabies. He stepped back and looked me up and down again. You're intelligent. The priests speak very well of you. So, I can count on little Joseph 
Hey. Uh, yes, sir. I said, my eyes are shown with pleasure and pride. You may go. Be here every morning at six o'clock. You understand? Yes, sir. When I was outside on the veranda, I felt I had just come through a hard battle. The end of my nose was perspiring. My master is thick set. His legs have great muscles, like the legs of a peddler. He is the kind of a man we call mahogany trunk, because the trunk of the mahogany tree is so strong that it never bends in a storm. I am not a storm. I am not a storm. I am the thing that obeys. I am the thing that obeys. From the sitting room, the commandant's sharp voice came demanding a beer. As I ran to save him, my cap rolled across the floor to his feet. In a flash, I saw his eyes grow as small as a cat's eyes in the sun. He stamped his foot, and the floorboards resounded like a drum. I was turning to go to the refrigerator when he pointed to the cap at his foot. I was nearly dead with fear. Are you going to pick it up? In a moment, sir. What are you waiting for? Well, I will bring you your beer first, sir. But... Then he said gently, Take your time. I took a step towards him, then I came back towards the refrigerator. I could feel the commandant near me, the smell of him getting stronger and stronger. Pick up your cap. Feebly, I bent to pick it up. The commandant grabbed me by the hair, swung me round, and peered into my eyes. I'm not a monster, but I wouldn't like to disappoint you. Joseph, he said, be a man, and above all, think what you're doing, right? I took off my apron at midnight. I wished the commandant good night, sir. Today is Saturday. The whites in Tangan usually spend their Saturdays at the European club run by Monsieur Janopoulos. All the houseboys are free at 12. On my way back to the location, I met Sophie, the African mistress of the agricultural engineer. She seemed angry about something. Ah, Sophie. What's wrong with the day off? I asked her. I am a proper fool, she said. The one day, my white man leaves his keys of his strong box in his trouser pocket during siesta is the day I don't go through them. <laughs> you want to stop him going back to his own country? Fuck his country and fuck him! It makes me mad when I think of all the time I've been going around with an uncircumcised sword. And what have I made out of it, hmm? Now today comes my chance, and I miss it. I must have mud between my ears instead of brains. Ah, Sophie. Sophie, v, don't you love your white man? I mean, he's the most handsome white man in Dangan, you know? She looked at me for a moment and retorted. You talk as if you weren't black. You know very well that whites haven't got what we fall in love with. Asuna. Asuna? I am waiting! Waiting my chance, and soon Sophie is off to Spanish. Get me! Well, what do you expect? We don't mean anything to, the, to them either. It's a good job, it is mutual. Only I am sick and tired of hearing. Sophie! Sophie! Don't come today. I've got a European coming to the house. Sophie! Oh, Sophie! You can come. The European has come. Sophie! When you see me with the white lady, don't look at me or don't look at me. Oh, Sophie! Now you can come to me now. Oh, no, Sophie! Don't come to me! Sophie! Sophie! Come to me! 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 And all the rest! We walked on side by side without speaking, thinking our own thoughts. What a fool I am. 
she said again as she went off. When I arrived at the residence this morning, I was surprised to see that the cook had got there before me. I heard a familiar fit of coughing. The commandant was having his shower. He called me through the bathroom door, which was ajar. He sent me to fetch a bottle from beside his bed. I came back a few seconds later and knocked on the bathroom door. Come in! He was naked under the shower. I felt a strange embarrassment. Well, did you get the bottle? He shouted. Well, what's the matter with you? He said. N nothing, sir, nothing. I said. My throat felt tight. He came towards me and snatched the bottle out of my hands. I backed out of the bathroom. The commandant made a vague gesture and shrugged his shoulders. No, it can't be true. I told myself. I, I couldn't have seen properly. The great chief, like uh, the commandant, uncircumcised. Well, he has seemed to me more naked than my fellow African brothers who stripped unconcerned and washed at the water channel. So I told myself, you see, like Father Gilbert, like, like Father Van der Meer, like, like Sophie's lover. I was relieved by this discovery. It killed something inside me. I knew I should never be frightened of the commandant again. When he called me to bring his sandals, his voice sounded far off. I seemed to be hearing it for the first time. I wondered why I used to tremble in his presence. My coolness surprised him. I took my time over whatever he told me to do. He shouted at me as he always did, but I did not move. His eyes as once struck panic into me. Now I stood unconcerned under their gaze. Have you turned into a complete nincompoop? He snapped at me. A nincompoop? I must look that word up in the dictionary. A cock, a doodly doo. It was a fresh morning. The grass was damp. The drips from the palm trees rattled onto the metal roof of the residence. Dangan slumbered on beneath the pure coverlet of mist brought down by the early morning rain. The commandant shaved, pomaded, and in high spirits, was seeing to the loading of the pickup van. The sentry had left his post. His large foot was pressing down on the pedal of the pump, inflating the red tires. The driver was standing on the front bumper, giving the windscreen a final polish. Then everything was ready. The commandant looked at his watch. He glanced towards the residence and noticed me. Get in, he said. We're going on tour. The commandant took the road to the agricultural station. The engineer, wearing black, was waiting for us at the foot of the steps. A thermos flask protruded from the traveling bag in his hand. He got up beside the commandant. He leaned out of the car door towards the villa. What are we waiting for? Get in. The question was addressed to a shadow that could be heard yawning on the veranda. Who is he? Asked the commandant. A cuisinier boy. My cook said to the engineer. It was Sophie. She seemed ready to fall with sleep as she came down the steps. The engineer shone a torch towards her. Sophie rubbed her eyes and cast it under her breath. Yet, my God, she was beautiful. Her mahogany skin gleamed like bronze in the light that flooded over it. She adjusted her sandals, then took a few steps forward, uncertain. She went up beside the door of the van where the engineer's arms were hanging out. He pointed to the back. Sophie sat down beside me on an empty petrol tin. She was completely enveloped in her cloth. 
She looked straight in front of her as if she did not see the trees that sped dizzily by either side of the road. The wind was cold. There was a smell of the American tobacco the engineer was smoking. We were flung into the air. We came crashing down again on the packing case, our insides in agony. Christ, what have they got? What have other women got that I haven't got? What I want to know is what have other women got that I haven't got? Mondi Sophie. She turned towards me. Two big tears were rolling down her cheeks. I laid my arms on her. She wiped her eyes with her cloth. What lovely manners they have got, these whites, even if it's only amongst themselves. My ass is as delicate as the asses of the ladies they've got up in the driver's cabin. Sophie began to cry again. She shut her eyes. Her long, wet eyelashes turned into little black tufts of hair. Through the rear window of the cabin, the engineer's green eye met mine. He turned his head quickly. The truck had now left the area that had been soaked by the previous night's rain and was jolting along something between a proper road and a mere track. From time to time, we passed a long clearing in the forest. Sophie had stopped complaining. She said nothing. Her tears had dried, leaving on her cheeks two streaks of nondescript color. Evening found these whites broken by the journey and the day's discussions. They hardly touched their evening meal. The commandant was stretched out across his bed. I knelt down to pull off his boots. A murmured conversation between Sophie and the engineer reached us from the veranda. I wished the commandant a good night. As I was going through the door, the engineer who was still sipping his whiskey on the veranda, called it to me. Where is he? Night had already fallen. I went towards him, guided by the red glow of his cigarette. Tu dors dans la même case que Sophie, n'est-ce pas? You are sleeping in the same heart as Sophie, aren't you? He said. Yes, sir. He paused for a moment and then went on. Je l'enverrai à l'hôpital aussitôt arrivé à Dangan. I'm sending her to the hospital as soon as we get back to Dangan. Je l'enverrai à l'hôpital. I'm sending her to the hospital. He stood up and resumed. Sophie m'a été confiée par son père. Sophie was entrusted to me by her father. D'ailleurs, je me demande pourquoi je raconte cela. But why am I telling you this? Je l'enverrai à l'hôpital. I'm sending her to the hospital. Et je serai te retrouver. And I shall know where to find you again. He pulled me by the ear. Je saurai toujours te retrouver. I shall always know where to find you. Tu peux disposer. You can go now. He let me go. Through the darkness, I saw his white hands move in a gesture of disgust, as if he had touched something unclean. Sophie was waiting for me in the yard. We walked over to our heart in silence. The hand cackled as Sophie pushed open the door. She gathered the brands together and blew on them. A flame flickered and lit it up, the inside of the heart. I lay down and at one of the bamboo beds. She yawned. You have they cut your tongue out? Aren't you talking tonight? My mouth is tired. <laughs> what a man you are. Really, I've never come across a man like you. You are shut up all night in a hut with a woman. And you say your mouth is tired. <laughs> when I tell people, they will not believe me. They will say, perhaps his knife isn't very sharp. <laughs> he prefers to keep it in its sheath. <laughs> mm, mm, perhaps. I said, amused. When I tell them, yes, he admitted it, they will not believe that either. Do you want to know what my boyfriend had to say to me on the veranda? Uh, are you asleep? Uh, no, 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 Sophie, I'm listening. I said, she went on with her monologue. First, 
He started calling me names of things to eat. <laughs> he always does that when he's mouthing me or when he's moaning on the job. He calls me my cabbage, my pool, my chicken, my crepe caramel, my glass of citron, my beurre bourguignon, my bouillabaisse, my crème brûlée. He told me that he brought me here with him because he loves me so much and that he didn't want to leave me alone in Dangan where I would get bored. He is sly. The truth is, he didn't want to leave me alone in Dangan with old Janopoulos. Well, he is old enough to be my grandfather. And he said I ought to leave him because he hasn't got any money. Still, I prefer my boyfriend to that old toad. He told me that he was afraid of the commandant, his chief. And that is why that he had said, oh, that he was afraid of the commandant, his chief and that you couldn't tell him that he was my boyfriend. And that is why he had said that I was his cook. I, I couldn't care less about that. What gets to me is why it was a cook he told the commandant. Hmm. Joseph, do I look like a cook uh, to uh, you? Sophie, 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 I don't know. I'm not a white man. I told her. <laughs> you? You are not like any other man at all. What was he on to you about on the veranda? Nothing. He was just telling me that I should look after you. Ah, oh, these whites. <laughs> the dog will die besides his master's meat. They don't bury the goat up to its horns. They bury him all together. Her voice seemed to be coming from further and further away. For a moment, I seemed to hear it in a dream. I fell asleep. of news, so startling it is hard to take it seriously. <laughs> the commandant's wife arrives in Yaounde tomorrow. <laughs> As the commandant unfolded the piece of blue paper, he went quite red. He leaned against the wall as if someone had hit him. He began to talk out loud, disjointedly. Europeans have this way of going red and you can't tell whether they are pleased or not. The cook, the sentry, and I did not know what to think. The commandant called us in and he told us the unexpected news. We showed him how happy we were. For his sake, our laughter and noise, we were clapping our hands as well, took him by surprise. He smiled weakly, then stopped us instantly with a look. He sent the sentry to go get some prisoners to wash the residence. He told us to get everything into order. He wrote notes to the doctor, the prison director, and the gallet, then went off to Yaounde. She has arrived at last. How pretty she is. How nice. I was the first one to see her. I was just giving the veranda a final sweep when I recognized the sound of my master's car. I didn't say anything to the cook. I rushed over to the sentry, who was dozing off. How funny it was to see him wake up with a start and present arms without anyone giving the order. Jack Lord! My master got out of the car. I ran over to open the door for Madame. 
She smiled at me. I saw her teeth. They were as white as our own girls have. This is very unusual. The commandant's strong arm was around her wasp like wasting. He told her, This is Joseph, my houseboy. She offered me her hand. It was soft, tiny, and limp in my big hand that swallowed it up like a precious jewel. Madame went quite red. Then the commandant went red too. <laughs> I got the cases out of the car. My happiness is neither day nor night. <laughs> I didn't know about it. It just passed upon my whole being. I will sing to my fluid. I will sing to the, to the banks of the rivers. From now on, my hand is sacred and must not know the lower regions of my body. My hand belongs to my queen, whose hair is the color of ebony, with eyes that are like the antelopes, whose skin is pink and white as ivory. Today, Madame made a tour of her new home. She was wearing a pair of black slacks. How they showed off a fine figure. First, he, she visited the kitchen and congratulated the cook on how clean he kept the pots and pans. And also, his pule ori. yes. My yem yem biji abwa. The cook was in ecstasy. He went on about his 30 years of experience and how he had been all the time a very good cook boy. The laughter went out of Madame's eyes. They became hard. Next time, put in less pimento. She said. The cook looked at her round-eyed. Madame's first Saturday at Tangan. The European club was deserted for the residents. The whole white world of Tangan was there. Oh, Madame was dressed in her all white dress like a newly opened flower. For a while, it is the center and the whole world flutters its wing around it. You could feel that Madame was there. The commandant, moved about with that trace of self-satisfaction that belongs to a man who knows he has married a beautiful wife. He was so elated that when he called me, he said, I said, Joseph, which he has never done before. What the difference the love and beauty of a woman can make in the heart of a man. While the men were all admiration in Madame's presence, the ladies, did not quite manage to conceal under their forced smiles a certain bitterness at being so eclipsed. Madame Salvain was like an oil lamp fetched into the sun. The brightness of Madame's beauty showed up everything which the good Lord had forgotten to bring to perfection in all those white ladies which we had once admired in Tangan. The doctor's wife looked as flat as party flung at a wall. Madame Gallet was stuffed into her slacks like a cassava in a banana leaf. The Madame Soir du Bois were alike as a pair of sacks. The wives of the Greeks, usually talkative, were silent. The American ladies from the Protestant mission <laughs> only existed in their bursts of laughter. For the men, Madame seemed a kind of vision. They, they had forgotten all the attention they had lavished on their wives in the streets of Tangan. <laughs> there was no attention now except for Madame. Yet, among them all, there was not no one who was able to hold Madame's attention. I had a terrible moment when I saw her eyes linger imperceptibly on the engineer. My eyes meet hers over his shoulder. 
It lasted only a flash. Then she turned her eyes away. I felt myself filled with embarrassment. Like the day my eyes fell on the commandant's uncircumcised foreskin. <laughs> hey! Have you gone to sleep? <laughs> you swear he had sleeping sickness. <laughs> Come on, Joseph! Come on! Conversation came round again to the natives. Pauvre France. Poor France, said Galet. Les nègres sont ministres à Paris, madame. Natives are now ministers in Paris. What was the Republic coming to? Each of the Reopens present found his own reason for asking the question, what is the world coming to? Then they talk about the need for a coup d'etat regenerate France. They spoke of their kings, about someone called Napoleon. Everyone was astonished when Madame said that the stepfather of the Empress they called Josephine was a Negro. <laughs> First drops of rain rattled on the corrugated iron roof of the residence. The doctor and his wife were the first to rise to their feet. The others followed. They slithered about the floor as if they were on a banana skin. The commandant, when addressed, merely grunted. <coughs> and he left Madame to lead the guest out onto the veranda by herself. <coughs> The cars moved off. Madame waited until the last red light had disappeared into the night. I went with Madame to the Tangan market. She insisted on going herself and doing her own shopping. She was wearing her black slacks that show off her figure and the large straw hat that she had brought with her from Peru. The marketplace in Tangan is about five minutes from the residence. It is a yard with a shed like sheds along two sides. In one of these, there is a butchery, and in the other, a shop for fish. There is a stream 
full of rubbish used at the dustbin, and sometimes for bathing. When we were a dozen yards away, the Africans removed their heads. Without showing they were addressing me, they called out in our language if this was really her. I am glad I met her before I go to the confession. One of them said, If she had been the one to pour ointment on our Lord's feet, the Bible story would have been rather different. Now there's a woman, a woman among women. See the way those buttocks go. What a figure, what hair. What couldn't I do with what is inside those legs? Man, your shorts must be sold. What a shame. It's all reserved for the uncircumcised. <laughs> Comments came flying from all sides. The women admired in silence, their hands over their lips. One of them said, Her buttocks are too soft. Boy, what are these people saying? Uh, nothing, nothing, madam. I said, embarrassed. What do you mean, nothing? She said, turning around. All the jabbering everywhere I go must mean something. Well. They think that you are very pretty, madam. I shall never forget the look she gave me as I brought out these words. Her eyes grew small, and an expression I cannot describe came over her face. She had gone red again. I felt a prickly heat over me from the nape of my neck down to the soles of my feet. Madame did her best to smile. That is very nice of them, but she said, Why all the, why all the secrecy? Why are you looking so stupid? The rest of the way home, she did not speak. <laughs> Madame was swinging in a hammock with a book in her hand. While I was bringing her something to drink, she asked me, Boy. Why don't you like working at the restaurant? I stood disconcerted, my mouth open. She you, went on. You look like you find it a drudgery. Oh, of course, we are very satisfied with you. You have no faults. You're always punctual. You are a conscientious worker. But you haven't got the, the joy one finds in African workers. You give the impression you're doing a houseboy's job while waiting for something else to come along. Madame spoke without a pause. Looking straight ahead, she turned it towards me. What does your father do? He is dead. I'm sorry. Madame is very kind. What did he do when he was alive? He set porcupine traps. <laughs> How funny. <laughs> And can you set porcupine traps as well? Yes, madam. She swayed <laughs> back and forth in the hammock and tapped the ash from the cigarette she was contentedly puffing. She blew smoke out of her mouth and nose into the space that separated us. She picked off a tiny piece of paper stuck to her lower lip and blew it towards me. You see? She went on. You've already got as far as being the common dance house boy. She gave me a smile which curled her upper lip. Her eyes gleamed. They seemed to be trying to make some discovery in my face. To cover up, she emptied a glass and said, Are you married? No, madam. Yet you earn enough to buy a wife. Robert says the common dance house boy would make a very good match. You should start a family. She smiled. A family. A big family. Well, perhaps, madam. But my, my, my wife and my kids will never be able to drink or eat like madam or like white children. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. She laughed. <laughs> you are getting big ideas. She went on. You must be serious. Everyone has their position in life. You are a house boy. My husband, the commandant, nothing to be done about it. 
You are a Christian, aren't you? More or less, madam. Well, what do you mean, more or less? Well, not very Christian, madam. Christian because the, the priest poured water on my head and gave me a European name. I can hardly credit what you are telling me now. The commandant told me you are a very firm believer. Madam, we have to believe the white man's story, more or less. Oh, so that's the way it is, is it? I had taken her breath away. Don't you believe in God anymore? Have you gone back to being a pagan? The river does not go back to its spring, madam. I think there's a proverb like that in madam's country too. Yes, indeed. Well, it's all very interesting. She said, amused. Now get my shower ready. How hot it gets. <laughs> The master had been away on tour for two weeks now. Madame seemed nervous all the afternoon. She asked me several times if anyone called. She had the sentry in and asked him the same question. I wonder who she could be expecting. Then she began to pace up and down on the veranda. Madame is growing bored. The prison director came to have a chat with Madame. I wonder if he was the one she was expecting the other day. It was him. It was Monsieur Moreau that Madame was expecting the other day. Why didn't I think of him? Of all the whites in Tangani, Monsieur Moreau is the one who is really a man among men. The Africans call him Muru Isiswali, the white elephant. He is the kind of man you can't help remembering once you've seen him. Those broad shoulders stick in the mind. Everyone in Tangan feels a certain respect, even the commandant. I wonder why he didn't come with the others to welcome Madame. Has the lion waited till the shepherd has gone before coming to devour his ewe? The sentry came to me this morning on tiptoe with his big finger on his lips. Madame was still asleep. He laid his arms on my shoulders and I felt his wet lips at my ear. I had no idea what the secrecy could be about. The truth is, he said under his breath, can I deny that I saw the prison director leaving Madame after midnight? The sentry took me by the hand and it drew me closer to the edge of the veranda. Things are as they are. He went on mysteriously. And someone is to be blamed for them. They go the way they have to go. If I talk, it's because I have a mouth. If I see, it's because I have eyes. And the eyes goes farther and faster than the mouth. Nothing stops it. So, I am talking. He said, after a pause, he passed his big hand over his lip. I am talking. And I am saying, the panther is prowling among the sheep. It's not me. It's this that saw it. The sentry watched me as if we were expecting something. You are lucky you are still able to sweat in this cold weather. He said, I see you still have young blood. Without thinking, I brought my hand up to my nose. It was damp. I sat down on the steps. I felt filled with a strange numbness. My legs seemed to have disappeared. You might have told me instead of getting drunk by yourself, said the sentry sitting down heavily beside me. You, you might have brought me something to warm my belly. He yawned. Did you hear them talking all night? I heard myself asking. Who? Said the sentry, puzzled. What, what do you mean, who? Madame and... Akia! He shouted. That's how it always starts. With questions that don't end. You know, I don't understand you. You youngsters today, in the times of the Germans, we took no interest in the affairs of the whites. I don't understand. I don't understand why you ask me such a question. He sighed. I didn't tell you I had them. I told you that what they said came into my ears. I didn't do anything. 
These whites, once their passions get a hold, nothing else matters to them. came back this morning. It is not a good sign that it should come so unexpectedly. The sentry says he must have had a dream that someone was sleeping with his wife. I was washing up when the familiar sound of the engine came to a stop by the garage. It was 11 o'clock and Madame, who has not been getting up till noon since her husband went away, was still basking in a night of love. I ran out to the garage to take my mother's luggage. Ah, hello, Joseph. Isn't Madame in? She's still in bed, sir. Is she ill? I don't know, sir. My master hurried towards the residence, his stubby legs working backwards and forwards busily. I came up behind him on my long legs, carrying his bag on my head. I felt sorry for this man so anxiously running towards a wife who no longer cared for him alone. I wanted to see how Madame would behave with her husband home now she had deceived him. She was waiting for the commandant on the veranda, wrapped in her bathrobe. She gave a pale smile and went towards him. My master kissed her on the mouth. This time, she did not shut her eyes. I stood behind them. I could not ask them to make way for me to carry the master's bags into the room. I lowered my eyes. For a fraction of a second, I raised them and they met Madame's eyes. I saw them grow small, then large, as if she could see something that astonished her. Instinctively, I looked down at my feet to make sure I wasn't standing beside a poisonous snake. I heard my master asking Madame what was wrong. <laughs> but you look quite ill, Susie. Oh, it's nothing. She said. <coughs> My master still had his back to me. Madame's eyes never left me. The commandant released her from his arms and they went inside. Lunch was gloomy. An oppressive silence filled the whole house. I stood quietly by the refrigerator. The commandant has his back to me. Madame kept her head bent over her plate. Before my master went away, the meals had always been very cheerful with Madame's gay chatter running on. The commandant asked his wife again if she were ill. I told you I am perfectly all right, she said. I don't understand. I don't understand, muttered the commandant. Perhaps the heat is affecting your nerves. You must see a doctor. Are you sure you haven't got a headache? Yes, a little. Said madame. She sounded remote. Boy, bring some aspirin, ordered my master. When I gave the box to madame, her hand was trembling. You see, you'll feel better, said the commandant. But you must see a doctor tomorrow. Cette histoire là m'a tourné piné, piné yé yé. Après une rencontre, une enculée, piné yé yé, car c'était salé. 
c'était sucré, c'était un tout petit thé pimenté, c'était si bon. Mm. L'année d'après, elle était prête à recommencer tout ça, ça, ça y est, yé, yé, oh, 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 ça, ça y est, yé, 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 yé. Cette histoire-là m'a tourné piné. Après une rencontre inonculée. Car c'était salé, c'était sucré, c'était une toute petite pimentée, c'était si bon. La nuit d'après, on était prêts à Ça, y est. Ça, ça y est. Ça, ça For the first time, Madame had a visit from her lover while her husband was here. Monsieur Moreau at the residence. My stomach was uneasy all the evening, and now I'm furious with myself. How can I get rid of this ridiculous sentimentality which makes me suffer over matters which have nothing whatever to do with me? The Europeans certainly take chances when their emotions are involved. I hardly expected Monsieur Moreau to come to the residence now that the whole of Tangan knows about him. But the commandant is too convinced of his own importance to suspect his wife. He spent the entire evening stuffing himself like a turkey, quite unaware of those little superfluous attentions that Madame was lavishing on him like a woman whose conscience was not clear. Nor did he notice the icy politeness between Madame and their guest, the politeness of accomplices pretending not to know each other. It is interesting how many expressions follow, one after the other, across a woman's face at times like this. <laughs> Madame had one set of little smiles for a lover, and a completely different set for her husband. Oh. When she smiled at Monsieur Moreau, I could see only her eyelashes. <laughs> when she smiled at the commandant, you could tell from the perspiration on her forehead how hard she was trying to keep the laughter sounding completely natural. <laughs> Helping away an imaginary tear, she just managed. <laughs> <laughs> the commandant, the commandant gave a little supercilious laugh, followed by an expression of irritation, as if he were vexed that the prison director had not noticed how condescending he was being. Then the director gave a tentative laugh, and this in turn brought some laughter from Madame. <laughs> <laughs> this time, it was quite genuine. Madame's eyes happened to wander in the direction of the refrigerator where I was standing to await my orders. She went red and immediately changed the conversation to the subject of Africans. Monsieur Moreau talked about those he had in prison. From the way he talked, you would have gathered that Dangan prison was a kind of African paradise, and that those who came out fit first had died of sheer delight. Ah, these whites. Madame was waiting for me on the steps. When she saw me, she stopped walking up and down. She kept her eyes on me as I came up. I have been waiting for you for half an hour. She said, controlling her impatience. Why did you go off like that at midday? I thought your work day finished at midnight. Where have you been? In the sun, madam. I said, giving my silliest smile. That made things worse. Are you making fun of me? No, 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 madam. I said, putting on a stammer. You think you're very clever. She For said, some time now, you've begun to think you can do what you like. And everyone has noticed it. Even the guests. 
The prison director knew what he was talking about when he said what you need is the big stick. She went on. And that is what you're going to get. That is what you're going to get. We shall see who wins in the end. She looked towards the kitchen. She carried out an inspection and found a broken decanter. She fixed the price and deducted it from the cook's wages and mine. It and came to half our month's earnings. That is only a beginning. She said. Only a beginning. My master is off into the bush again this morning. He is indefatigable. I am frightened. It makes things very awkward for me. While he was here, I had some security. What has Madame got up her sleeve? She says nothing. She won't even call me by name. She just signals. She signaled me to come this morning when she gave me the letter. I had to take it to a lover as soon as her husband had gone. The prison director was busy with two Africans suspected of stealing from Monsieur Janopoulos. He was... Teaching them how to behave. With the help of a constable, he was giving them a flogging in front of Monsieur Janopoulos. They were stripped to the waist and handcuffed. There was a rope round their necks tied to the pole in the flogging yard so that they couldn't turn their necks towards the blows. It was terrible. The hippopotamus hide whip tore up their flesh. Every time they groaned, it went through my bowels. Confess, you thieves! Shouted Monsieur Moreau. Give them the butt of your rifle, Jangula! The huge tribesman, Jangula, ran up, presented his weapon, and he brought it down the butt on the suspect. Not on the head, Njangula! They've got hard heads! No, in the kidneys! Njangula brought the butt down on their kidneys. They went down, got up, and then went down again under another violent blow to the kidneys. Monsieur Janopoulos was laughing. Monsieur Moreau panted for breath. The prisoners had lost the consciousness. Monsieur Moreau is right. We must have hard heads. When Jangula brought down his rifle party the first time, I thought their skulls would shatter. I could not hold myself from shaking as I watched. It was terrible. I thought of all the priests, all the pastors, all the white men who come to save our souls and preach love of our neighbors. Is the white man's neighbor only other white men? Who can go on believing the stuff we are served up in the churches when things happen like I saw today? <laughs> It will be the usual thing. Monsieur Moreau's suspects will be sent to the black man's grave, where they will spend a few days painfully dying. Then they will be buried naked in the prisoner's cemetery. On Sunday, the priest will say, Dear beloved brethren, Pray for all those prisoners qui meurent sans avoir fait la paix avec Dieu. who die without making their peace with God. Monsieur Moreau will present his upturned topi to the faithful. Everyone will put in a little more than he had intended. All the money goes to the whites. They are always thinking up new ways 
to get back what legally money they pay us. I can't remember what I did when I got back to the residence. I was so upset by what I had seen. There are some things it's better not to see them. Once we have seen them, you can never stop living through them over and over again. I don't think I shall forget whatever I have seen. I don't think I shall ever forget what I have seen. I don't think I shall forget what I have seen. I, I don't think I shall ever forget what I have seen. I shall never forget that guttural in human cry from the smaller of the two suspects when Jangula brought the Bhatta down on him with such force that even Musu Moro swore under his breath and Musu Janopolis dropped his cigarette. Musu Moro turned around suddenly and beckoned to me. He grabbed me by the shoulder. Monsieur Janopoulos exchanged glances with him. I could feel his hand through my jersey, burning and damp. When we were out of sight of Monsieur Janopoulos, Monsieur Moreau took his hand from my shoulder and he began to feel in his pockets. He offered me a cigarette and lit it up himself. Don't you smoke, he said, offering me a light. Not in the daytime, sir. I said, not knowing what to say. He shrugged and took a long throw at his cigarette. Tell Madame I'll be over at, uh, let me see. Um, tell her I'll be over at three o'clock, all right? Yes, sir. I said, he held me by the back of my neck and made me look at him. The cigarette I had put behind my ear fell down I tried to bend down and pick it up so I would not have to look at him. He put his foot on the cigarette and I felt his fingers tighten on my neck. No tricks with me, eh? He said under his breath, forcing me to stand upright. Listen, my lad. He said. Those chaps in there, they know me. See? He pointed his thumb over his shoulder towards the prison. Then he smiled and tossed me the packet of cigarettes. The movement was so unexpected that I missed my catch. The packet flew over my head. Pick those up, they're for you. He said, laughing. You play with me, you get things given you. You're my friend, aren't you? Yes, sir. I heard myself say. Good. You remember what I told you? Yes, sir. What did I tell you? You said you were coming to see Madame at three o'clock. Good. Don't forget to tell her. When is the commandant coming back? I don't know, sir. Good. Off you go. He said, tossing me a five franc note. He turned and went away. When I got back to the residence, I found my hand had torn the notes to pieces. Madame was watching for me to come back, pretending to be busy with the flowers. She came up to me where I was, then her smile froze. She went red. She tried to look me back in the eyes, but it turned away. She slept at an imaginary fly on her leg. He's coming at three o'clock. It's siesta time. I said, moving off. Her lips moved. Her breasts were going up and down like a bellows. Her color became Asian. She cupped her chin in her left hand, smoothing her dress with the other. When I joined the cook, he said to me, You, you are going to be in trouble. Talking to Madame all the time with a smile in the corner of your mouth. Didn't you hear how she said, Thank you, Monsieur Tondi. It is a bad sign when a wife is being polite to a native. He came along, swinging a little chain round his fingers. When Madame saw him coming, she called me and told me to bring two whiskeys. Madame always drinks whiskey when her husband is away. She jumped out of the hammock 
and offered the prison director her arm. It was bare to the shoulder, and he kept his lips pressed to it for a long while. He was confident and expectant. Madame twisted herself away, standing up on her toes. They both laughed and went into the drawing room together. Madame sat down on the sofa and indicated to the prison director the place beside her. I drew up a little small table on which I had placed the two whiskies. He's a funny chap, your boy, said Musu Moreau as I was going away. He's Musu Tundi, said Madame, stressing each syllable. How long has he been with you? Asked Musu Moreau. Robert took him on, said Madame. He seems he was Father Gilbert's boy. Father Gilbert's successor spoke very well of him. He rather fancies himself, has ideas about his own importance. Just lately, he has been taking liberties. But he knows how far he can go. It's no good pretending to be putting away the china, said Madame, raising her voice. Open a bottle of Perrier and leave us alone. I brought the bottle of the fizzing water. Will Madame Bing wanting anything else? I asked. No. She said impatiently. I bowed and backed out of the room. When I was beneath the veranda, I heard the door shut and the key turn in the lock. Oh. <laughs> I see. A song was running in my head. I noticed. I was singing it out loud. It is a song we sing when someone is dying. Madame was writing letters. She raised her head from time to time. And without seeing me, her eyes wandered over the refrigerator I was polishing. Boy, is the shower ready? She called to me through the dividing wall. Yes, madam. I said. She tried to whistle, but soon ran out of breath and fell silent. <laughs> da! The noise of a portly smashing on the cement floor brought a sharp damned. She called me to clear up the mess. It was one of the bottles of preparation she put on her face at night. Pieces of broken glass had gone under the bed. I knelt down and probing under the bed with the broom brought out not only broken glass, but also some little rubber bags. There were two of them. Madame heard the sound of sweeping stop and looked round. When she saw me turning the little bags over and over with the end of the broom, she sprang on me and tried to push them back under the bed with her foot. Instead, she trod on one of them and the liquid squid out of it onto the floor. Get out. Get out. You don't know what these are. You don't know contraceptives. Contraceptives! Go on, tell everybody. Oh, what a subject for all the house boys in Dungan to be talking about. Go on! Get out! The commandant arrived out of the blue this afternoon. We were not expecting him until the end of the week. Madame herself seemed disconcerted. The commandant's face was drawn. In his crumpled, grabby shorts, he looked like a schoolboy who had been playing truant. He got out of the car without a word, picked up his briefcase, brushed his lips against Madame's forehead, and made his way heavily to his room. Madame told us to unload the car and then went after him. She left the door open behind her. She called to her husband and asked him what was wrong. <coughs> he replied with a grunt. She went on badgering him, and at last 
he said that she was looking too well to go worrying over him. She was silent for a moment. Then she told him he was being unfair. She went and laid down in a hammock on the veranda and for a long time was lost in her thoughts. After he had rested, the commandant called for a shower. Madame got out of a hammock and in turn went into the garden. The commandant called me and sent me to find her. She was staring straight in front of her, her chin, her chin between the thumb and finger of her right hand. She did not hear me coming, and when I coughed, she was startled. She listened to my message without a word and followed me back to the residence. When the commandant called me, I had a feeling he had just changed his mind about something, and that was why he sent me to look for Madame. He was half lying down on the couch and holding something hidden in his hand. It was the time for the evening aperitif. When Madame came in, I took up my position behind the refrigerator as an excuse to stay in the room. The commandant did not look his wife in the eyes. He seemed distant and bitter. What is wrong with you? His wife asked, touching his shoulders. The commandant shrank away. Then, noticing I was there, he allowed his wife to touch him. He kept his left hand clasped under the table. Madame's eyes and mine lighted on it at the same moment. He raised this glass with the other hand and emptied it at a single gulp. He called for some more brandy. Brandy! For Christ's sake! Brandy! For Christ's sake! Brandy! For Christ's sake! He bellowed. He filled up two glasses, which he drank off one after the other. Madame tried to stop him. The commandant pulled his arm away violently. Madame ran off into her room. Uh, the commandant tried to stand up, but fell. He missed the couch and slipped it down onto the floor. As I helped him up, he swore at me. I had never seen him like this, even before Madame came. He managed eventually to go and get to sit again and stay for the long time staring at the ceiling. His hands crossed on his stomach. Suddenly, Madame passed out of her room. Get out! No! Let him stay! Get out! Let him stay! He was sitting on the edge of the couch, looking at his wife. She stood petrified in the room. Suddenly, he held something at her. It slid along the floor towards the refrigerator. It was a lighter, Monsieur Moreau's lighter. I had only seen it once when Monsieur Moreau came to dinner, but I recognized it. Madame put her head into her hands and it dropped into an armchair. What about that? shouted the commandant, pointing at the lighter. What do you have to say about that, eh, Madame de Casey? Sobs began to shake her shoulders, but she controlled herself and raised her head arrogantly. Boy, leave us. She said. Leave us? shouted the commandant. Are there any secrets between us? All the houseboys in Duncan know about it. Yes, you sleep with Moreau, the man you considered such a bore. We can't go on together after this, said the commandant. You didn't even give it a bit of time before you started deceiving me out here as well. And the natives have to know all about it before I did. He gave a pale smile and went on. For them, I was in Govina Jaingal Avesut Pisanak Abematua. Do you know what that means? Of course you don't. You never bothered to learn the local language. Well, it means that everywhere I go, I am now the commandant whose wife opens her legs in ditches and in cars. And you! He shouted, lifting his head in my direction. You were the go-between, eh? For a cigarette from Moreau and a little present from Madame, eh? He shook his head sadly and he dropped it back onto the couch. Madame was still crying. The clock in the residence chimed midnight. The 
commandant was watching me out of the corner of his eye. And I could feel Madame's eyes through her fingers. I untied my apron before I went out onto the veranda and hung it up as I did every night after my work. I bowed and wished them. Good night, sir. Good night, madam. The commandant stared on the couch and it turned against the wall. Madame came and closed the door after me. Outside, the night was like pitch, a night without star or firefly. The cook was listening, open-mouthed. Every now and then, he cracked his finger joints with astonishment. When I had finished telling him what I have just seen, he looked at me nervously and then turned away his head. If I were in your place, he said, I'd go now before the river has swallowed me up altogether. Our ancestors used to say, you must escape while the water is still up to the knees. While we are still about, the commandant won't be able to forget. It's silly, but that's how it is with these whites. To him, you are like a, what can I call it? Uh, you are like a, you are like an eye of the witch that sees and knows. A thief or anyone with a guilty conscience will never feel at ease in the presence of that eye. Nothing today. Nothing today except steadily mounting hostility from the commandant. He is becoming completely wild. Kicks and insult have started again. He thinks this humiliates me and he can't find any other way. He forgets that it is all part of my job as a houseboy, a job which holds no more secrets for me. I wonder why he too refers to me as Monsieur Tondi. commandant and madame kissing. I thought he would have held off longer. He was like a little boy caught stealing something he had pretended he did not want. Now I realize madame can do whatever she likes. You! Now you've started spying on us! Paul did the commandant panting for breath. All through the evening he dared not look at me. Madame had a faint smile on her lips and her eyes were contracted to two round dots. She stared now at the commandant, now at me, and drummed on the table with her fingers. <clears throat> the commandant was sitting on the couch behind his wife, with his head in a newspaper, pretending to read. I finished clearing the table in the afternoon heat. The commandant had not said a word. His looks are expressive enough, especially when he is angry. They had all been directed to me. It's hot, he said, unbuttoning his khaki shirt. It's hot. Why don't you take off your shirt and just sit in your bed, said his wife. He unbuttoned his shirt completely and he pulled it out of his shorts, but he did not take it off. His wife looked on Indifferent, she went back to her novel. The commandant called for a glass of water. When I brought it to him, he asked if the water had been boiled. It is always boiled, sir. I said. He picked up the glass of water between his thumb and finger and held it up to his eyes. Then he held it at arm's length, raised it above his head, then brought it down again to eye level. He brought it up to his nose, 
made a face, put it down in the tray, and said, Fetch me a clean glass. I was arrested this morning. It happened when I was serving breakfast. The agricultural engineer and Musumoro threw up outside with a screaming of brakes. They ran up the steps and they apologized for disturbing the commandant so early in the morning. It's about your house, boy, said Musumoro, twisting his neck in my direction. <coughs> the coffee pot slipped from my hands and smashed on the cement floor. He knows why we've come, said Monsieur Moreau, warming to the business. Don't you, my boy? The commandant pushed away his cup, wiped his mouth, and turned it towards me. Madame smiled, curling up the left corner of her mouth. Sophie's laugh, excuse me, Sophie's laugh seemed rather ill at ease. He asked Madame if he could smoke. It took him two attempts to get the cigarette alight. Voila! Now, he began. My cuisinière has disparu avec la cassette de gage. My cook has disappeared with the workman's wages. Je me suis rendu compte à 6 heures. This came to me to my notice at 6 o'clock. La cassette avait disparu de mon bureau. The box had gone from my desk. J'ai appelé ma cuisinière boy que vous connaissez. I called my cook whom you know. Sa chambre était vide. Her room was empty. La salope. <coughs> the pi... <coughs> He coughed so as he would not have to finish and to cover up that he had tried to correct himself when it was too late. Then he went red. She has gone off with my cash box and my clothes. As well as her own things. He gave me a look as if he could slice off my head. It seems she is the fiancé mistress of your houseboy said Monsieur Moreau, rather proud of the compound noun he had invented. When I was warned by Monsieur Magnol, I closed the frontier. My men are now searching the location. We thought your boy... How much was in the box? asked the commandant. 150,000 francs! A hundred and fifty thousand francs. 150,000 francs! A hundred and fifty thousand francs. I see said the commandant eyeing me. His wife whispered something in his ear. I saw his eyes open wide. They talked together for a moment. The commandant cleared his throat and pointed at me. Well, what do you have to say? Do you know the person involved? Yes, sir. Where is she? He put on his self-satisfied look puffing out the underside of his chin and giving a list to his shoulders. Then, after a brief discussion with his wife, he rubbed his hands and without looking at me, he said, Well, you will have to settle this affair with these gentlemen. Monsieur Moreau twisted his neck, Sophie's love aside. Come on, let's go, said Monsieur Moreau, getting to his feet. The lover of Sophie went out first. They apologized once again to the commandant and his wife. I went after the two white men. Monsieur Moreau and the lover of Sophie had come in a Land Rover. So that I should not escape, Monsieur Moreau came in the back with me. The lover of Sophie drove. We took the road to the police station. Monsieur Moreau held on to my belt, and from time to time, he trod on my big toe with his boots, all the time watching me closely. The agricultural engineer drove at speed. Pedestrians scattered in panic as the Land Rover lashed past. Then we turned off to the police camp and stopped in front of a leakly discolored tin shed. A tricolor fluttered over the roof. This was the police station. Monsieur Moreau jumped down from the Land Rover and dragged me with him. My knees were already bleeding. A constable ran up and then stood to attention. 
to show his enthusiasm for duty, the constable struck heavily, struck me heavily on the neck with the edge of his hand. Everything was swallowed up in a great yellow flesh. When I came to, I was lying face downwards on the ground. Monsieur Moreau was astride my back, giving me artificial respiration. Ça y est. That's it, said Sophie's lover. Il revient à lui. He's coming to. They got me to my feet. Monsieur Moreau asked me where Sophie was. She's going to Spanish Guinea. I said. Comment le sais-tu? How do you know? She told me. Go, hein, go! When, hein, when? Eight months ago. Et tu savais qu'elle allait faire le coup hier soir? You knew about last night. No. Et comment sais-tu qu'elle allait partir au Guinée espagnol? Then how do you know she was going to Spanish Guinea? She told me she would. Eight pour... months ago. Et pourtant, tu étais son amant. Anyway, you were her lover. Monsieur, Sophie's lover's face darkened at that time. He grabbed me by the neck of my jersey and stared into my eyes. I fool her! Admit it, he screamed, breathing foul breath into my face. I fool her! Admit it. I felt a terrible urge to laugh. The two white men watched in astonishment. Then Sophie's lover let me go. Monsieur Moreau shrugged. She's not my type. I said. She's not my type. I used to listen to her without really looking at her. Monsieur Moreau's hand trembled. I thought he was going to fling himself at me. His face began to twitch all over. Leakly inarticulate noises came out of his mouth. Ça va être difficile avec celui-là. It won't be easy with this one. Je ne crois pas qu'on tirera quelque chose. I don't think we'll get anything out of him. They called the sergeant and whispered something in his ear. The sergeant handcuffed me and pushed me in front of him. We went into his house. The sergeant is the head of the constables and his name is Mendimetiti. It is the funniest name I've ever had. The translation is meat water. He is a kind of hippopotamus man. When he comes, you withdraw strategically unless you want to make a sudden appearance in front of St. Peter's knocker. They haven't done much to you yet. He said, taking a look at me. If they send him here though, that's what it's for. We must see what we can do. You must look bloody. We'll pour some ox blood on your shorts and jersey. Can you cry? We began to laugh. They think because I am not from around here, I will have no mercy. We spent the day playing cards. It was about 11. When Monsieur Moreau and the lover of Sophie came to the police camp, I had splashed myself with ox blood and was lying down, groaning. Monsieur Moreau shone his torch in my eyes and grabbed me by the air. I don't know how I came to be really crying. I had been practicing making little sobs, and by the time they came, I was crying as I had never cried in my life. Good said Monsieur Moreau, letting go of my head. Where is Sophie? He asked, grabbing me by the neck. Uh, this is a tough one. We shall see. Monsieur Moreau shouted from Jangula. Ah! <laughs> 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 
blood. My body has let me down. There is a shooting pain through my chest, like a hood caught in my lungs. A part in the chest from Jangula is not a thing you get over. At midnight, I was pretending to be asleep. The Europeans came back. I opened my eyes, just enough to see. Monsieur Moreau was there. He was swaying backwards and forwards on his feet. How happy he looked. He must have his punishment, he said. Take care of him and send him to me. He is a dangerous element. I shall make him talk. I shall set to work on him tomorrow. The Europeans went away. I must get away. I must get away. Uh, go to Spanish Guinea. Go to Spanish Guinea. And Sumeru. Sumeru is not going to have me. Monsieur Moreau is not going to have me. The constable. It's snoring already. The hospital clock has struck three in the morning. I must take my chance. I must take my chance. But it's a slim one. But it's a slim one. There was a sinister roll of drums. Liberté. Thank you. 